Thank you, Captioner. We can see your test. Hello and welcome. Welcome to the Humphrey School. Good evening and welcome to the Humphrey School. Yay! We still have a number of our friends getting seated in a pretty full auditorium. It's fantastic to see you all here this evening. I am Nisha Bochway. I am the dean here at the Humphrey School, and it is a pleasure uh, to have you here this evening for this talk. Welcome to this special evening. We have the privilege of delving into history's pages and discovering the profound impact of Hubert Humphrey's legacy through insightful lens, the insightful lens of Sam Friedman's book, Into the Bright Sunshine. Tonight, we are not only joined by the talented author, uh, but we are also honored to have Kirsten Delagard, a prominent figure in the field of public history, as our moderator this evening. We also extend our heartfelt thanks to our co-sponsor, the University of Minnesota Libraries, for their invaluable support. We'll hear from my friend and colleague, fellow Dean Lisa German, a little later. Um, after the discussion between Sam and Kirsten. I'd like to also take the opportunity to recognize the family of Hubert Humphrey, who is here with us this evening. I won't make you stand, but if you would just wave. Um, it's so wonderful. to have you with us this evening for this, uh, what promises to be a fantastic conversation. This evening we are here to learn more about the life and times of Hubert Humphrey, a figure whose courage and conviction left an indelible mark on American history. Samuel Friedman is a distinguished figure in the world of journalism and education. He has been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award, and has won the National Jewish Book Award and the New York Public Library's Helen Bernstein Award. His columns for the New York Times about education and religion have received national prizes. As a professor at Columbia University, he has been named the nation's outstanding journalism educator by the Society for Professional Journalists. Like, I don't know about you, but I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Sam meticulously uncovered the nuances of this pivotal moment in history, a moment when a relatively unknown mayor from Minneapolis took center stage and helped steer the Democratic Party and our nation toward embracing civil rights. A dear friend of the Humphrey School and Humphrey family, Sam became a regular within the building and the gopher tunnels that connect our campus buildings um, here on the East Bank and then eventually over here on the West Bank, the Best Bank, and eventually over <laughs> to the East Bank. Part of his writing process was surrounding himself in the building that's the namesake of Hubert Humphrey. And we've been able to connect during that time together here. Sam, it's been a pleasure having you in the building with us. 
Our moderator this evening is Kirsten Delagarde. She brings a wealth of expertise to our discussion. Her dedication to public history and unearthing the complex past of her hometown has led to groundbreaking initiatives like Mapping Prejudice, a project that is housed at the university libraries. Kirsten's commitment to revealing the untold stories of our communities aligns perfectly with the mission of the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. We are a community that values diversity, fosters inclusivity, and champions justice. It is through endeavors like mapping prejudice that we gain a deeper understanding of our shared history and in turn chart a course toward a more just and equitable society. Tonight, as we engage in this dialogue, and I promise I'm almost done, let us remember that we are not mere spectators of history. We are not mere spectators of history. We are active participants in the ongoing journey toward a bright, more inclusive future. So let's begin this evening's conversation with open hearts and open minds. Together we will explore into the bright sunshine, honoring Hubert Humphrey's legacy and the enduring pursuit of human rights. Thank you for joining us and please welcome Kirsten and Sam to the stage. Hello, can you all hear me? Yeah, good. So um, even though I'm standing over here, Sam, I'm so delighted to be here with you and, your, and, and everything that you said. Um, I, one of the things that I really appreciate about you is your gratitude and the way you express your gratitude. So, um, and, and people have already been louding, uh, you know, touting your accomplishments, but I just wanna say, you know, I, I'm gonna say a couple more words about that. Um, so that people really know how lucky we are to be here with you tonight. Um, so we already know you're an award-winning journalist. Um, we know um, that you've mentored hundreds of journalists. Um, you've authored 10 books. And um, as someone who uh, has, has writes, that number frankly makes me feel a little faint. I mean, just, uh, and, and more impressively, this is not just quantity here. These, this is quality. Like they, they've been shortlisted for the Pulitzer and the National Book Award. And of course, tonight we're here to talk about your latest work, um, Into the Bright Sunshine, um, which since its release, it, the book has been widely discussed and enthusiastically reviewed. Um, so the New York Times put it on its recommended reading list, um, and the National Book Review declared it to be hot. So, you know, that should, you know, that should, that should quicken. There's a lot of book lovers in the house. That should quicken your pulse, right? So, um, so, you, so of course, you tell the story of a young politician, Hubert Humphrey, and his decision to make central, uh, civil rights central to his agenda as mayor of Minneapolis um, in 1945. And of course, in 1948, this, um, this, uh, Humphrey put his net nascent political career on the line when he demanded that the Democratic Party incorporate a civil rights plank um, in its platform. And um, this, is, this is the story of the book, how he goes to the party convention in Philadelphia and calls on delegates to get out of the shadow of states' rights and walk forthrightly into the bright sunshine of human rights. And of course, that's the, that's the line that becomes the title for your book. Um, and that speech is regarded as, uh, now regarded as a high point for 20th century po American political oratory. So you argue that, your book argues that um, Humphrey's political courage changed the course of American history. Um, you, you assert that the speech helped Truman squeak to victory, um, and it certainly catapulted Humphrey into national politics. Um, he went on to serve three terms in the US Senate um, uh, where he would author the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, he then would, of course, become vice president to Lyndon B. Johnson, and he would mount um, two campaigns to become president of the United States. 
Um, and the reputation of Minneapolis rose in tandem with um, Humphrey's political ascendancies. In the 1950s and 1960s, um, the city was celebrated, in the words of a magazine writer, as a city that had beat the bigots. So, um, so your book calls on us to do a lot of things, right? And we're going to talk about all the things. Um, but it, call, it calls on us to reconsider the career of Hubert Humphrey. Um, you know, I know we're sitting in the Humphrey School. Um, but I think it's important for us to acknowledge that 45 years after Humphrey's death, he's still somewhat of a polarizing figure. Um, so just this summer, for example, historian and former Harvard University President Drew Faust um, singled Humphrey out in her new autobiography. Have you, have you, yeah? So, so she castigated him, in her words, um, uh, for his support of the Vietnam War in 1968. And I would say that um, her, what she wrote about really reflects a lot of um, the opinions of a lot of people of her generation who, who came, came of age fighting the war. So Humphrey is the narrative driver of your story, but this book is so much more than a biography. Um, and that's what I love about it. So it transports, it transports us to a place and a time where, as you wrote, the center no longer held. And it serves as a reminder, in the words of University of Minnesota um, a professor of history, Will Jones, that Minneapolis has long been a hot spot for struggles against racism. Um, so in, the, in that vein, it really calls on us to interrogate some of the more tenacious popular assumptions about my hometown. So um, it serves up equal doses of inspiration and caution for this moment in history when the whole notion of inclusive democracy is really um, under ex existential threat. So for those of you here who have not yet finished the book, I want to say that you're in for a treat. So it has all the hallmarks of a skilled journalist with a gift for story. It showcases the talents of a skilled archival historian. It's infused with a literary sensibility that makes it a page turner. Um, and it tells us a tale with vivid characters who are fighting an epic battle of good and evil. Um, so with that, I'm going to move over to you. Well, first of all, thank you. <laughs> So maybe now I get to leave and go to the buffet. Um, <laughs> but seriously, before going any further, there are some thanks I need to pass along. And I've been very fortunate on this book to get some exceptionally strong reviews, the kind any author uh, dreams about. But I had one review that had a serious criticism to levy, which is that my acknowledgments went on too long. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, so in spite of that criticism, and I'll try not to go on, I have some oral acknowledgments to offer tonight because I, this book would not exist without the Humphrey School and the University of Minnesota. Um, that's not an opinion. That's an absolute fact. Um, Dean Nisha Batwe and her predecessor, Dean Laura Bloomberg, gave me a home here for the parts of my working life and I'm away from my other home at Columbia Journalism School. Office space, library privileges, great colleagues. Um, and without that, I could not have done the research that was the foundation of everything in the book. And also, Dean German oversees the library system here in which I was, believe me, a regular customer. If you looked at my list of withdrawals from the stacks, it would be pretty impressive, as well as all the online resources, and microfilm, and interlibrary loans, the archives that Kate Dietrich oversees of the Upper Midwest Jewish Archives. All that was essential to this book. And, you know, to also create friendships with uh, Dean Botchwe out of this just, you know, adds to it. The Humphrey family, Bill Howard, Skip Humphrey, Julie Howard, supported this book from its origins eight and a half years ago and gave me access to some of the private and familial archival papers of Hubert Humphrey over in St. Paul at the History Center that really let me get to know the inner man. And they've just been in my corner the whole way, and I can't express that deeply enough. And then um, in this North Star state, I've said I have two North Stars for this book. They're both here tonight. 
One sitting right next to me is Kirsten Delegard. Her public history work with mapping prejudice and with Historiopolis was a standard I felt like I had to meet for intellectual courage, for scholarly rigor, um, for the fluency of her writing. And my other North Star is Professor Emerita Ravellen Prell, whose amazing, groundbreaking, in the best way disturbing uh, multimedia project, A Campus Divided, revealed the hidden or deliberately obscured history of this university in the 30s and 40s practicing anti Semitism and racism. And again, Ravellen's um, moral courage her scholarly integrity set the standard for me. And then finally, my wife and longtime Minneapolitan, uh, Chris Bloomquist Friedman, who was in on this book from the outset. If you read the book, you can go to those long acknowledgments, um, <laughs> which start with the anecdote about a question she asked of a friend of ours, the historian Julian Zelizer, that really set this book into motion. She was my partner in all things with this book, including editing all 160,000 words of it, even putting up with my finickiness at one point. She said to me, do you count syllables? I said, yes, I count syllables. <laughs> um, how else is the sentence going to have a good meter? Um, and she also, there's a PowerPoint I'm going to rely on later to show some relevant historical photographs. And as a longtime graphic designer, Chris also put together several PowerPoints. So in so many ways, including the dedication this book is for her. And she's an alum, she's a master. Right. Masters of Liberal Studies at the U. So Kirsten, let's start. Let's with, start, okay, let's start with, okay, who are you, Sam Friedman? Uh -huh. <laughs> In your own words, like we've been all describing you tonight, uh -huh. but who are you and why did you write this book? Why, why, why a biography of Humphrey? I'm this guy from New Jersey. Um, who uh, discovered Minneapolis, by the way, in the summer of 1977 as an intern for The Star, which was then um, a standalone afternoon paper. And because I was very low, along with the other two interns on the seniority list, one of my jobs was when Jim Klobuchar would take the jaunt with Jim bike trip every summer. And he would, in those days, long before cell phones, internet, go to a phone booth and phone in his column and someone would have to take dictation. And so one of my lessons in writing that summer was to take dictation from Jim Klobuchar. Wow. <laughs> but, um, but that was my introduction to Minneapolis. So I actually have a long, I do have a long history here, even though I didn't win the Bake Off and get the full-time job at the end of that <laughs> summer. But um, my, I've written in my 10 books repeatedly about issues of civil rights and race. It's stuff I keep coming back to. Um, but, and with this book, I'd honestly not set out initially saying I want to write a book about Hubert Humphrey. I've been looking for a bunch of years to write a book set in the immediate post-World War II period. Because I felt like there are a lot of books deservedly about World War II. There are a lot of books about the 1950s and especially the civil rights movement that is understood not actually correctly to have begun in the mid-50s with Brown versus Board of Ed and Montgomery bus boycott. But it felt to me like there was this relatively uncharted historical territory right after the war. It's like this country didn't go from VE day to everyone's mowing their lawn in Levittown or Edina or wherever. Um, and I just could never find the right subject. And I won't tell the whole story of Julian Zelzer's book talk and Chris's question to him, but in his answer, he referred to Humphrey's speech on civil rights at the 48 convention and what a landmark it was. And I knew about that speech and I did understand its historical impact, but something about hearing Julian say it just made the light bulb go off for me. And then I pretty immediately realized this was a way to write about a part of Humphrey's life that most people certainly of my age didn't know about or didn't care about. We remembered Humphrey the Hawk on Vietnam and Humphrey getting the nomination amid the bloodshed of the 68 Chicago Convention. And Humphrey is the establishment candidate running against the peace candidate George McGovern in 72. Um, 
So I felt like that was one gap, and the other was that there was this whole period of civil rights activity in the 1940s that gets very little attention, and that without understanding that activity and understanding how much it was catalyzed by the global war against fascism mm -hmm. and understanding how much it was a joint battle of Jews and blacks against their common enemies abroad and in this country, that if you didn't explore that, you couldn't understand where the civil rights movement mm -hmm. of the 50s and the black Jewish alliance of that period came from. Mm -hmm. So that just gave me a lot of incentive right from the beginning. Mm, that's really interesting. I think it's also really interesting that you came, um, that, you, that you had your introduction to Minneapolis in a decade when Minneapolis was really sort of at its high point in terms of national reputation in the 70s. But um, this book really focuses on a, on a very different period <laughs> of Minneapolis's history. Can you tell us what Minneapolis was like in the 20s, the 30s, um, you know, before Humphrey was, was elected? Sure. Well, Minneapolis, I want to go um, to an instructive set of images here. Minneapolis was really one of the nation's capitals of anti-Semitism and racism, sad to say. This was not the blue city. And I want to say that even with all of the brave work that the Farmer Labor Party did, with maybe the exception of Floyd Olson, the Farmer Labor Party was interested in issues of economic inequality to its credit, but it really didn't care about issues of discrimination against blacks and Jews. If that happened incidentally to be dealt with by lifting people economically, fine, they didn't have any beef with it. But this was sort of the flaw in a lot of purely class-based political action in this, uh, in this city. But more to the point, the, the photo up there on the top, that well-attired crowd, mm -hmm. that's an evening in July 1931 in South Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. A black postal worker and World War I veteran named Arthur Lee has just bought a home in a mostly working and middle class, mostly Scandinavian Protestant neighborhood. And the people of the neighborhood are besieging the home. Thousands of people every night are surrounding that home. They vandalize the house. They poison the Lee's pet dog. When the Lee's daughter that falls to start kindergarten, she needs a police escort. And look at these people. Have you ever seen the postcards of lynchings in the South and people are dressed in their Sunday best. They're not ashamed to be at the lynching. It's a, it's a holiday. Right. This is the same mentality in Minneapolis. Right. These people, even though it was, by the way, like a sweltering 90 degree night, yeah. are in coats, ties, fedoras, dresses, proud of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. That's revealing of something about racial attitudes in Minneapolis mm -hmm. in those decades. And then, of course, Lindbergh, as we know, was the aviation hero, but also the most treacherous exponent of isolationism and its anti-Semitic trappings um, in the 1930s and early 40s. And in the upper right photo, that's a group called the Silver Legion. That's why it has an L on the shirt, but they're more popularly known as the Silver Shirts. They were modeled on Hitler's brown shirts, and they had a very welcoming uh, audience here in Minneapolis. They held a lot of public meetings here in the late 1930s, and their meetings didn't just attract the great unwashed. It wasn't like the unemployed, resentful, blue collar person. Their meetings attracted the president of the Board of Ed, mm -hmm. the president of the Citizens Alliance, the right wing businessmen's group in town, doctors, dentists, teachers. That's who went to the silver shirts. Mm -hmm. And finally, the man uh, beneath them, William Bell Riley, set the tone, I think, of Protestant theology in Minneapolis, because this was a heavily Protestant city. And he was the most important fundamentalist minister in this country, linking William Jennings Bryan to Billy Graham. And Riley was this erudite, well-attired, learned person who would give sermons in which he would cite Plato and Shakespeare and George Bernard Shaw and he was an institution builder. His church is down on Hennepin First Baptist. He built what's now University of the Northwest. But he was also an absolute believer in this infamous forgery called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion from Tsarist Russia that told the supposed story of how Jews were trying to take over the world. 
And when someone of his establishment's credibility would preach about that and write about that in Minneapolis, it sanitized those views. So this was the history, I'm sorry to say, it gives me no joy, of Minneapolis for much of the first half of the 20th century. It really doesn't get taken on frontally until Humphrey becomes mayor in the mid 40s. To go a little deeper, you've already given a shout out for, to Riv Allen. Um, tell us about the University of Minnesota. How did this fit into, and, how, and talk a little more about the Campus Divided uh, I, I will. Exhibit. Well, Riv Allen Pearl's amazing work looks at, at the same time that the, U, that the U, in many ways, was presenting itself as this very kind of progressive, um, racially and ethnically inclusive place, like Zora Neale Hurston was invited to speak here, and Langston Hughes spoke here, and, and so on. The policies, as Ravellen revealed, were that black students could not live in the dorms. They all had to live off campus. A lot of them would rent rooms at um, the Phyllis Wheatley Settlement House up in North Minneapolis. Um, Jewish students were all presumed to be Bolsheviks. And the dean of students, Nicholson, would do a tally. He'd do a census of all the black and Jewish students. And he would report, particularly on the Jewish students, the putative revolutionaries, to a right-wing Republican operative named Ray Chase. Um, and this was used to smear people. And these, this is what was going on at this university. If you wonder what some of the renaming uh, efforts were about, that's what they are about. And partly out of my great, great respect for what Ravellen did and for the groundbreaking research she did, I haven't gone into tremendous depth about that in my book simply because she has written the book, so to speak, on that already. But I do point it out because as part of the broader um, zeitgeist of Minneapolis at that time, and what it goes to, Kirsten, is something that um, I think it's Bill Green, and correct me if I'm wrong, who's come up with this phrase, racist, racism without racists. Is that William Green's phrase, or am I misremembering that? Yeah. Help me out. Who is it? It's another yeah. professor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anyway, it gets to that idea that we're not bad people, mm -hmm. but somehow these terrible things are happening. Yeah. And when I read, um, for instance, the mainstream newspapers in town here, they would excuse away the Arthur Lee siege. Mm -hmm. They would excuse away the Silver Shirts rallies. Um, if they would report at all, it would be to say, these are just an ignorant handful of people. This is not our city. But it was our city. And that kind of complacency was part of what allowed it to take root and to get so entrenched. And it was something that Humphrey and his allies, who we're going to talk about later, I know, had to take on that if it was as simple as going after the extremists, you'd have a, an easier battle. It's all the enablers. Right. It's all of the passive people who think it's going to go away on its own right. who are the other um, adversaries you have. Right. right. So that's a great segue into, um, so the, obviously Humphrey is at the center of this, this incredible narrative, and he's the driver. But one of the things that I love about the book is all the other cast, the, the whole cast of characters that you provide for us from the past in Minneapolis. Um, so can you talk about Cecil Newman and Sam Shiner? Shiner? Sure, and here they are. So, <laughs> you know, Hubert Hump, <laughs> I'm telling you, marry a graphic designer. Um, <laughs> Hubert Humphrey, when he came to Minneapolis after grad school at LSU, which we'll probably talk about later, in 1940 to begin his public life, has already been awakened to the strains of racism and anti-Semitism in this country. And he'd been oblivious to them in Minneapolis during his college years here for a variety of reasons. But when he comes back, he now has his radar up, but he still needs more education. And these are two of the most important people in Humphrey's entire life. So Cecil Newman, as some of you may know, was the founder publisher and a longtime editor of The Spokesman. And in fact, 
His granddaughter, Tracy Williams Dillard, is the publisher and editor to this day. Um, Sam Shiner was a lawyer who no law firm would hire because he was a Jew. And at the time, the Jewish community here got so alarmed by the Silver Shirts rallies and the indifferent attitude of establishment in Minneapolis to those rallies, they pulled together enough money to hire Sam Shiner to basically be a one-man anti-defamation league. And so Cecil Newman used the pages of the spokesman to wage what was often this very lonely battle against racism in the city. He wasn't the only person. There were people like the lawyer Lena Olive Smith, the labor activists Nellie Stone, later known as by her married name Nellie Stone Johnson, and Anthony Brutus Cassius. But I think Newman was really kind of the tip of the spear because he had the newspaper. And he would call out um, police brutality in ways that tragically anticipate George Floyd's murder. He would call out labor unions for not having black members, breweries for not having black employees, and so forth. And he would try to do what he could to shape public opinion, frankly, to publicly shame people. Um, but he was without access to political power for reasons I've already discussed. And very similar was Sam Shiner. Sam Shiner would send informants out to William Bell Riley's church and similar churches around the city to the right-wing rallies that you know, came after the Silver Shirts had you know, pulled back from Minneapolis. But similar-minded right-wing and isolationist groups, some of them would be very idealistic young Gentile students from the U who could go in undetected because they looked like wasps, and they often were wasps. And it would bring notes back to Sam Shiner. And I'll tell you a, a kind of a serial comic story. Shiner would, under assumed names, subscribe to these right-wing pro-Nazi, white supremacist, anti-Semitic periodicals under a slightly assumed name. Like he'd take on what sounds like a more Germanic name, Steiner. And uh, one day when he's out of town, the publisher of one of these magazines shows up in Minneapolis and needs a place to stay and goes knocks on Shiner's door to ask <laughs> if they can put him up. <laughs> and Shiner's wife answers the door and you know, manages to escort him elsewhere. But Shiner also <laughs> fundamentally had no political power. Right? Remember, Jews and blacks, maybe 3% of Minneapolis's population at this time. And even if you added all the Catholics, who themselves were the object of a great deal of bigotry, what does that bring the minority population up to? 15%, 20%? Um, this, by the way, is why St. Paul is so different in its attitudes towards blacks and Jews, because it is a Catholic plurality at this time. And pragmatically, that minority group needs to ally with other minority groups like, Catholic, like blacks and Jews to achieve a political majority. Anyway, what they had, Shiner and Newman, was knowledge that they could give to Humphrey. And what Humphrey had was political ambition and political skill and ultimately political power. And so the connection of these three people is vital. And I should also say one more thing, Kirsten. Shiner and Newman were very close personally. And they understood something really important that I mentioned before, especially against the backdrop of the rise of Hitler and the Nazi um, demonization of Jews, of blacks, of Roma, and so on. They understood, Shiner and Newman, that the battle against anti-Semitism and the battle against racism were one battle. They were partners in that. But again, even as partners, they didn't have the clout to accomplish much, and that's where Humphrey comes in. So you talk about, you talk about them being, um, Humphrey being an ally. Can you, can you talk more about like, what you mean by that? And what sure, that, what sure. That... I mean, that's a present day term, of course. It's a neologism. But I think maybe an even better term that I probably should have used in the book is partner. Mm -hmm. But I, the way I put it is this, is that Humphrey surrendered his white Christian privilege mm -hmm. in order to toil alongside blacks and Jews. And that's what I mean by being an ally or a partner that to really appreciate what it did, you have to look at where Humphrey grew up. This is Dolan, South Dakota. Um, to use another neologism from the great funk musician George Clinton, this is a very vanilla place. <laughs> and Hubert Humphrey grew up as a very vanilla person. 
Uh, he grew up in a small town that was overwhelmingly Protestant, Scandinavian, German, Northern Europe, British Isles, overwhelmingly conservative Republican in its politics, the least likely person based on demography to become a champion for the rights of blacks and Jews. And for reasons I'm sure we'll discuss, he made his way to that. But in doing that, he put himself at risk. He put his white Christian privilege at risk. And boy, do you know that when you read the hate mail he got. How many times he was called an end lover? How many times people you know, would castigate him for loving the Jews so much? There is this moment, Kirsten, one of my favorite moments in the book, when the Donald Trump of the 1940s, mm -hmm. Gerald L. K. Smith, mm -hmm. founder of the America First Party, who also found a very welcoming audience in Minneapolis, courtesy of Senator Ernest Lundeen, and after Lundeen's death, his widow Norma. Uh, this was Ernest Lundeen, whose speeches were being written, true fact, by a Nazi agent. Mm -hmm. um, but at one point in 44, when Humphrey is starting to break into public life, he's run unsuccessfully for mayor once. So he's on the you know, canvas of municipal politics. Smith comes to town and he wants to get a permit to give a speech at the municipal auditorium. And this creates this huge controversial meeting with the city council. And Humphrey is one of the speakers there as a private citizen. And he says something that, as the young people would say today, totally bugs out Gerald L. K. Smith. Who was a, you have to understand, Smith was an ordained minister. Smith propounded what he called Christian nationalism, oh, a term we've learned to regret. Um, and Humphrey says in the public comments part, you can't be a good Christian and hate Jews because Jesus was a Jew. And the idea of a historical Jesus is a no-brainer now, but to assert that in 1944 was really risky. And I read in the archives a 16-page, grammatically perfect, <laughs> handwritten letter by a school teacher named Ida Shainig going after Humphrey for the temerity mm. of saying that Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> mm. But we can laugh at it, but I yeah. want to tell you what yeah. the price you pay for giving up your white Christian privilege is. Yeah. Let's go to 1947. Yeah. This is the price you pay. One day, and I know I'm jumping around in time a bit, when Humphrey's mayor and is starting to move forward on civil rights and human rights in the city, He's coming home at about midnight from the rubber chicken circuit. And weirdly, the closest street light to his house on Southeast 19th, right near the U at that time, north of Dinky Town, the street light is out. So he's there like at the front door fumbling around with his key in the lock and five bull or three bullets zip by his head. Mm -hmm. And Muriel had been waiting up for him and pulls him into the house and they try to figure out like what exactly just happened. And Muriel remembers that their pet dog, Tippy had barked. And they theorize that Tippy's barking broke the concentration of the shooter. And that's why he missed. Now, Humphrey managed to keep this out of the paper for six weeks. But Skip remembered, when I interviewed Skip, the next morning, Skip comes down to go to school. And there's a police officer sitting in the living room with a sawed-off shotgun across his lap. And this was not the first death threat Humphrey had. There were others, and tons of hate mail. And the person who I'm quite sure tried to kill him is this man, Maynard Orlando Nelson, who was a follower of that man, Gerald L. K. Smith, and who was so furious with Humphrey for moving on civil rights and for his opposition to Gerald L. K. Smith that that's why I tried to kill him. And when Nelson was arrested on other charges later. That's what they found, guns, knives, a map of World War III, as he hoped it would happen, correspondence between him and most virulent racist in the House of Representatives, John Rankin from Mississippi, correspondence with a white supremacist group in Georgia called the Columbians. And if any of you remember the movie Driving Miss Daisy or read Melissa Faye Green's masterful book, the temple bombing. You remember the reformed temple that gets bombed? Mm -hmm. 
by white supremacists because the rabbis pro-civil rights, that was the Colombians. Those were, those were Maynard Orlando Nelson's peeps. And Humphrey almost died for his beliefs. So, you know, to be a partner, to be an ally, had some real consequences to it. I'm hoping you'll read for us. Will you read an excerpt? Okay, sure. Okay. Kirsten we, has, we agreed, has asked me to read this one particular part. And there are a few names here that um, you'll recognize. That I, so I think in context, you'll, uh, you'll get everything. This is from the epilogue of the book. Hubert Humphrey and Cecil Newman and Sam Shiner were all long dead, of course, by the time of Charlottesville, the Unite the Right rally, and the murder of George Floyd. Yet the sense of deja vu that Sam Shiner's daughter Susan Druskin and Cecil Newman's granddaughter Tracy Williams Dillard experienced, their encounters with the intractability of prejudice and hatred, raises questions about legacy. In Hubert Humphrey's years as mayor, he had transformed Minneapolis from a national example of bigotry into a beacon of progress against discrimination. Now, 75 years later, Minneapolis was once more notorious, with the image of George Floyd's lifeless body under Derek Chauvin's knee circulating around the globe. After a history of electing such advocates of racial equality as Harry Truman and Lyndon Johnson, and in the immediate wake of making Barack Obama the first black president in American history, the nation in 2016 had chosen Donald Trump. He was both the beneficiary and the architect of a reactionary coalition of Christian nationalists and unreconstructed racists, the metaphorical descendants of William Bell Riley, Gerald L. K. Smith, and Strom Thurmond. So do the shadows and dust storms triumph over bright sunshine in the end? Does the arc of the moral universe, contrary to Dr. King's prophecy, just as easily point away from justice as toward it? Or as the great black labor and civil rights leader, A. Philip Randolph eloquently put it, is America continuously engaged in, quote, the unfinished task of emancipation. The national endeavor to achieve a full inclusive democracy proceeds not with inexorable advancement, but through cycles of oppression, resistance, liberation, reformation, and retaliation. Ground can be lost, but ground can also be gained, inches at a time, and with tenacious effort it can be held. And this is a sentence that my wife suggested to me when we were talking about this part. Got to give credit where it's due. For all his flaws and failures, Hubert Humphrey had committed his life to the grinding work of trying. You're an incredible writer. Let's just, oh. let's just say the obvious here. So I, I want to wrap up with a discussion of the epilogue. Um, so, so I would say one of the most significant critiques of the book that I have seen is that it ends too soon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that you essentially conclude the book with, with the speech, right, in 1948. Um, and so I'm going to ask you some stuff that's beyond the scope sure. of the book. Um, because for me, I think the biggest mystery is what happens next. Right. And, right. Yeah. So, so growing up in Minneapolis, I grew up with a vision of Hubert Humphrey that was really rooted in a belief in Minnesota exceptionalism. So some of the stuff that we've been talking about. Um, but then I went um, south to do my PhD in American history at a, at a, in a history department that was very focused on civil rights, um, on the civil rights movement. And, um, and there I met a very different Hubert Humphrey. So, um, so that's when I learned about the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, um, which was organized by black civil rights activists to challenge the racist practices of, um, of the Democratic Party in Mississippi in the 1960s, um, which barred anyone who was not white from participating. 
So in August of 1964, more than 60 representatives of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party um, traveled to the National Convention in Atlantic, Atlantic City, um, uh, New Jersey, and they sought to be seated as delegates um, there. Um, and they, they demanded to, be, to replace the all-white um, Mississippi delegation. Um, so in, in that context, one of the leaders of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was a woman named Fannie Lou Hamer. And I just think the, the, the parallels are really significant that she also gives this, an incredible famous speech, one of the most famous speeches in American history to a national television audience where she describes um, what she had to endure in trying to register to vote. She, and she said, um, she concludes, she says, if the Freedom Democratic Party has not seated now, I question America. Um, so the person who was um, dispatched to quell this revolt was Hubert Humphrey. So, and he, he was the one who delivered the news um, that the Freedom Party could only have two seats right. at the convention. Um, and the response to that, um, Ella Baker called him a traitor. Um, you know, and Fanny, Fanny Lahamer, though, was the one who was really much harsher. She said um, he came to her, as she said, with big crocodile tears in his eyes. And she said, Senator Humphrey, I've been praying about you. The trouble is you're afraid to do what you know is right. And so, yeah. so I mean, so my question is, how do we reconcile the Humphrey that you described, the Humphrey that is in this book, with, with that? You know, that, um, that's, that's the mystery. No, I mean, it's me. filled with paradox, partly because at the 48th convention, Humphrey and his father, H.H., who was a delegate from South Dakota, were actually part of supporting an earlier, very little known insurgency by anti-segregation delegates to try to oust Mississippi's formal delegation of Dixiecrats. They didn't succeed, but, but they came very close, interestingly. So I think in 64, Humphrey was auditioning to be LBJ's vice president. And this was the task that um, LBJ gave him, the ugly task to prove his loyalty, that Humphrey was going to have to go and tell the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party that you're going to get two seats, not all of the seats. And one of Humphrey's longtime political friends and allies, Joe Rao, was the uh, attorney for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And this created also a lifelong rupture between Humphrey and Rao. So in some ways, it, this presages Humphrey's willingness to go along with Johnson on Vietnam too, although let's not forget that Humphrey was a cold warrior. So it's not as if that was um, a decision that had to be totally foisted upon him. But in this case, he was auditioning and he did what was required for him to do. But I do want to say a couple of things that in the moment, it seemed like a horrible betrayal. But there's a longer tale to the story, which I think argues somewhat on Johnson and Humphrey's side of it, which is that once the Mississippi Freedom Party got even two seats, the whole Mississippi delegation, the segregated Jim Crow delegation, walked out. So all 60 Mississippi Freedom delegates sat in the convention hall, even though only two of them were authorized to vote. The whole delegation did get to sit there, and because of the confrontation that was carried on national TV over this and Fannie Lou Hamer's eloquence, by 1972, the Democratic Party had changed its convention rules to forever outlaw such a thing as a segregated delegation. So in a somewhat longer time frame, what looked like an unacceptable, cowardly compromise did yield lasting change that we've seen. Um, but of course, in the moment, it looked like Humphrey, as Fannie Lou Hamer justifiably said, backing away from his own best angels. Right. Do we have time for one more? Maybe one, one more question? Um, so I'd say here in Minnesota, um, black leaders really were incredibly um, loyal to Humphrey until his death. I mean, that was something. Um, do you think that loyalty was merited? Totally, totally. Um, <laughs> I wrote a book about <coughs> a black church and its minister. And the minister, uh, Reverend Dr. Johnny Ray Youngblood, talked about equality in some of his parishioners he called theirness. Mm. You know, there are people just always there when mm. you needed help, when you needed something done, 
when you needed people to be sacrificial with their tithes and offerings. Um, they were always there. And Humphrey had thereness on racial issues. And got to remember, he was standing up on these issues when no white folks were doing it. Mm. In the 1940s, the movement is led, the freedom movement is led by A. Philip Randolph and Walter White, White Executive Secretary of the NAACP. The two most important Caucasian partners are Eleanor Roosevelt and Hubert Humphrey. No question in my mind about it. And people remember that. Black people, I should say, remember that. And that mattered more than whatever this quiet or outright opposition black voters felt about Humphrey stand on Vietnam, because he was there from 1940 onward. Lyndon Johnson, as courageous as he was, didn't come around to these issues till the late 1950s at the earliest. And a lot of other people you know, who ultimately joined on board similarly. Bobby Kennedy was a very late arrival on these issues. And so I think that was remembered and it was credited um, and the, you know, spoiler alert, the book for that reason, oh, and I should add, just filling in, they remembered that speech in 48. I read the mail and the telegrams that Hubert Humphrey got from black people all around this country thanking him. And that speech had, had concrete results. Two weeks after that speech, being forced to run now on a civil rights platform, Harry Truman desegregated the armed forces and the federal workforce. And by beginning the process of pushing out, expelling the segregationist wing of the Democratic Party, sending them on their way to Trumpism, um, Humphrey began the process of the Democratic Party becoming an inclusive, interfaith, multiracial party. And that's what sets the table for all the civil rights legislation of the 60s and for Barack Obama's two terms, and for the battles we're in now. And that was understood and remembered, and very deservedly. And so the book ends with this black couple, native of Al natives of Alabama, who moved to Gary, Indiana for work in the Great Migration. And a couple years after Humphrey's death, they drive all the way from Gary one day, go to Woodlawn Cemetery to visit Humphrey's grave, and they're going to drive back the next day. 500 mile drive just to spend 10 minutes at his grave. And lucky for me, a reporter from the Tribune, Ruth Hammond happened to be there that day doing a feature story on who visits graves. <laughs> 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 and she interviewed this couple, a Solomon and Aileen Slaughter. And Solomon Slaughter, she asked like, why? Why do you make this trip just for 10 minutes? And he, Solomon Slaughter says, he did something for my people and I thought it was right to pay my respects. And I think that speaks to what you were asking about. Um, well, can we give uh, another round of applause? Thank you. So thank you so much, Sam and Kirsten, for such an impactful and inspiring conversation. Can we please have one more round of applause? Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. My name's Lisa German. I'm the university librarian and dean of libraries here at the University of Minnesota. And our Friends of the Libraries organization are co-sponsors of this event with the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. I would like to thank my friend and my colleague, Nisha Bochwe, Dean of the Humphrey School, for hosting this wonderful program and allowing us to be the part of it. Thank you so much, Nisha. I'd also like to thank our Friends Board particularly Chair Lisa, uh, Lisa Longren and past Chair Doc, Dr. Amelius White for their dedicated and ongoing support of the libraries. And I've seen a bunch of library friends here tonight. You want to raise your hand, library friends? Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> to
tonight's event is such a great um, kickoff to the 2023-24 Friends Forum events. And if you didn't get enough of Sam tonight, and I'm sure you did not, um, and you'd love to hear more, there's um, more opportunities. The University Libraries and our Berman Upper Midwest Jewish Archives will be hosting an event with Sam on November 6th at 6.30 at Elmer L. Anderson Library, not too far away. At that event, Sam will discuss the process behind the writing of Into the Bright Sunshine. Specifically, he'll talk more about the Jewish history that is raised in his book and the research he conducted in the library's Upper Midwest Jewish Archives at the peak of the pandemic in the winter of 2020. It's a powerful example of the value of libraries and archives, and I hope you all can join us. Before we gather just outside the auditorium for a reception and book signing portion of the evening, Dean Boshway, would you please come join me for a special token of our appreciation to Sam. Thank you, Dean German. In recognition of Sam's outstanding work in illuminating the life and legacy of Hubert Humphrey, we want to offer a tangible piece of Humphrey's history. In 1978, as part of fundraising efforts for what was then the Humphrey Institute, a limited number of medallions were produced bearing the image of Hubert Humphrey. These medallions hold a piece of our school's history. Tonight, we believe it is fitting that uh, one finds its home with you, Sam, who has dedicated his talents to shedding the light on the life of Humphrey and the pivotal moments that shaped our nation's history. So, pl Sam, please accept this medallion as a symbol of our gratitude. May it serve as a reminder of the lasting impact of individuals like Humphrey, who through their unwavering dedication continue to guide us toward a more just and equitable society. I've been rendered mute. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd also like to give you some flowers as our thanks. So I'll make it some food. So thank you again for attending, and I hope you'll all come join us. Uh, oh, so great. <laughs>